Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, a conflict transformation online summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuna da Silva, and together with my friends Ben Roberts and uh, the other friend who's not here, Eva Schoenfeld, are hosting this summit. I'm very happy, we are very happy, me and Ben, to uh, host today a conversation with Guy Borges. Welcome, Guy. Thank you. It's, been, it's going to be the second conversation we have with you. The first one was some months ago in January uh for week two for the stage two of the summit about falling apart and now we're going to have this conversation to explore a bit of uh, other ways of understanding and seeing conflict that can nurture the soil can help us uh, be grounded in different ways of then relating with conflict situations guy you've been You've been working, uh, you, you have a PhD in sociology back in 79 from University of Colorado. You've been done postdoctoral work at MIT later on during the energy crisis of the early beginning of the 80s. You've been working with your wife a lot on, on focusing on diff difficult conflict problems ranging from international conflicts to domestic uh, within the U.S. context and also on environmental issues and public, publicly, public policy conflicts. It's really a great pleasure to have this chance to have another conversation with you. As a preparation, we were just talking how, how much the, the context changed since we last talked. We are now in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, it seems some of the things we pointed out as problematic ways to understand and deal with conflict got a, a bigger relevance in the current times. Perhaps we could start by talking a bit into that. Why, why you feel that uh, the, the patterns of response to conflict situations and our ways of understanding conflict became even more relevant as we are in this moment, living this particular moment of human history? Well, when we talked in January, uh, I talked a little bit about our Constructive Conflict Initiative Project, which was basically an effort to argue that the uh, destructive way in which societies around the world often handle intractable conflict is as serious a threat to human welfare as climate change or infectious disease or anything else. And part of the reason for that is that our conflict problems make it very difficult for us to deal with these other problems, which also include poverty and a wide range of issues. What the pandemic has done is made that all extremely urgent. And one of the essays that I was working on this morning actually tries to look at the uh, pandemic and all the things that we need to do to in some way uh, get through this. And there are certainly a lot of medical issues and there are a lot of economic issues. But one of the things that comes out again and again is that at the core of all of these things are the difficulties that we have working together. And this is a global problem and working together at that scale is extraordinarily difficult. And it's extraordinarily difficult in part because there are political actors, certainly in the United States and other places, that have figured out that maybe the best way they can think of to get through this is by blaming one another and driving us further apart. And that leads me to fear that we might be, at least in the United States, looking at what I call a Humpty Dumpty moment. Uh, Humpty Dumpty is a nursery rhyme. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't pour, pour Humpty Dumpty, this giant egg that fell off a wall, back together again. And if we let this turn into an event to drive us all apart, and we come out of it blaming all the other groups for what's going to be an enormous amount of pain and suffering, we're going to be in a world of trouble. But on the other hand, what I think we're looking at, and this is the optimistic side of this, is a, is a never again moment. 
where it's become abundantly clear to pretty much everybody that we've got to find a way to work together to solve all of these problems. And now is the time to um, start thinking very systematically about what we need to do to not only repair the international system and our system for dealing with crises like this, but to make it a whole lot better than it's ever been before. Part of the driver behind the populist rebellions that were causing a lot of trouble around the world is that the global system was in many ways not serving the interests of the larger population. So it isn't a question of putting it all back together the way it was because it was really great before, it wasn't. It's putting it back together the way that it needs to be. And that involves breaking the conflict problem down into its various constituent components, uh, setting up a specialization process. You know, it's, it's a huge problem. You can't have one person or one um, line of thinking solve it all. What you have to do is specialize. And some people are good at understanding how we communicate uh, among very large groups using mass media. Other people are better at uh, framing the cultural vision of how we're going to balance all of our competing interests. There are other folks that are better at dealing with corruption. There are people who know how to work through and explain technical information. So we've got to specialize and start to address some of those things. So what we're trying to do and is to semi-systematically with a very limited budget and sadly all the organizations working in this field have a pretty limited budget and that's part of the problem is to start cataloging um, all of the different things that people are doing to more constructively address various aspects of the problem and that's how we nurture the soil because ultimately what nurturing the soil is about is building a learning accelerator so we can move everybody up the learning curve a whole lot more quickly uh, than you would otherwise be able to do it. And that's the kind of thing that um, the internet and the ability to share information instantaneously and freely around the world gives us the potential to do. So I can continue to elaborate on some of that yeah, and give you please. guys a chance. To... Yeah, and I'm particularly interested in what you, I mean, you've been looking at these intractable issues, intractable conflicts for what's now like three decades. So I'm yeah, curious at least. to see like what, what insights you've gained in terms of the ways we need to shift our understanding of, of these tensions and conflicts between people in ways that could serve us better, particularly to address the, the challenges you, you just mentioned. Well, I think the, the biggest insight that's come out of all the years that we've been working on this, and we've spent that time listening to you know and reading books and articles and presentations and lots of people have made very persuasive arguments that this particular conflict related problem is very serious and this is the way that you deal with it and there is a tendency for this all to be a big competition and when we first started the intractable conflict knowledge base project we we had this image that there were a whole lot of competing visions about how to deal with difficult and tractable public policy problems. And we found out that that's by and large not the case. What you have is lots of different people working on different aspects of the problem. So it's not an either or between various approaches, it's a both and kind of thing that you've got to figure out how to take all of these insights and apply them simultaneously. And this goes back to this division of labor approach and this thinking big approach that I alluded to earlier, 
is that it's not the sort of thing that you can do around a table. There's a song about somebody dreaming that there was a great meeting and people would sit around a table and sign a paper and that'd be the end of war. And that's not the way it happens, is what it, the way we change these is that in conflict interactions at all levels of society and all communities, people have to change the way in which they interact with one another. And these interactions can involve factual issues, collaborative opportunities, strategies, or efforts to come to terms with the unrightable wrongs of the past. There are a wide range of things, and different people have developed specializations and techniques for dealing with different parts of the problem over the years. And now what we need to learn how to do is to put them all together. And everybody needs to have at least a rough sense of the big picture and where they fit within that, but then specialize on how they can make a difference in their particular community on dealing with some part of the problem. Uh, there's an old line that came out of the, I guess it was the turbulence of the 1960s and 70s in the United States. This is the civil rights era and the Vietnam era and all of that. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that's still true. Yeah, that, that line of thinking prompted me to change my, my work back in 2002. Um, from being a small businessman to wanting to, to contribute to systemic change. And, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you name that this idea that these are all of these different approaches are, are needed. It's a both and it's a it's a, you know, a, a specialization need for specialization or I would say, you know, a whole ecosystem of things, a kind of biodiversity, if you will, and that they need to be held together, you know, aligned around some how did you put it? a rough sense of the big picture was the term you used, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, and I, so I guess my question to follow up on that is how much do you think there's, there's room, you know, the, the part of what that implies is that we accept that lots of different things are going to happen and we're not going to agree with all those approaches. And instead of getting into battles and fighting one another around whether, you know, trying to reform the system from inside of it versus resisting, you know, and stopping the worst of it and, and you know, versus, you know, building the new, you know, that which of these are right, you know, we have a general says, I'm not, I'm not going to argue strategically and lose energy around those versus that there's something more sort of coordinated around how all the pieces fit together. Because I think one of the most common stories we hear about what, what's missing, what's needed, is some kind of coordinating system so that we, look, we operate more like you would imagine, you know, a company would operate or a village as opposed to, you know, a, a wildly diverse ecosystem uh, mm -hmm. with no central kind of management to it. So do you have a sense of where on sort of the spectrum of all that this diversity of approaches that, you know, all these different aspects, kind of how they knit together in theory? A couple of, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that I think it's useful to think of the roles that individuals play in, the, in these efforts to coordinate large scale social responses. So coordination isn't quite the right word to encourage more constructive large scale societal responses is that we're all in the nudge business. This is an enormously large and complex and multifaceted system. There's no way that you're ever going to get agreement. Okay, we're all going to go this way together right now. But what you do is, what you can do is you can nudge the system in more positive directions. And different people have different images of what positive is. Uh, but we all tend to agree on what are the really bad negatives that we want to move away from. Uh, we did have a um, project years ago where on nonviolence uh, called Justice, with a non Justice Without Violence. And we had a full philosopher on the project team. And he could blow holes in any theory of justice that anybody would come up with. Um, but what we agreed on was that, well, we couldn't agree on what justice was. 
we could agree on what terrible injustice was. And if we could just get make some substantial progress on fighting terrible injustice, that would be a heck of an accomplishment. Uh, so a lot of these things are not necessarily nudging towards some ut agreed upon utopia, but nudging us away from the big traps that threaten us all. Um, and the other image that we have is there's a coordination problem. And I think there is a need for a, uh, a new profession of generalists that try to look at the big picture. Uh, right now, universities are so hyper-specialized that the line is that you come out of there knowing everything about nothing, that you get to be so focused that you don't see the big thing. And so we need people to get a broader understanding, but that isn't in the sense of, okay, these are the guys who then direct the way the world works, uh, because that's unworkable and it also is subject to corruption in all sorts of terrible ways. But what we want is people who can identify gaps. So right now, when as we confront any big social problem, everybody tends to flock to a few of the big high profile things that need doing. And there are a lot of other things that need doing that fall through the cracks. Uh, they're less, you know, in the world of peace building, you will find high profile cases like Rwanda where there are lots and lots of money and lots and lots of projects, but other countries that suffer other problems get nothing. Um, and that dynamic is repeated in all sorts of ways. Um, so what you sort of need is somebody who systematically identifies gaps in the system. And I've got this sort of crazy Google Maps uh, vision of how to save the world. Um, and the idea is built on two, two ideas. One, at least in our part of the world, and I imagine lots of other places, we have an adopt a highway program. So you, every so often you drive by on the road and there's a sign that says, this group took responsibility for cleaning up this stretch of the highway. Now, if you go on Google Maps and especially something like Waze that will not only tell you, it'll tell you where the traffic problems are, and the traffic system is a complex system. It'll, sh it'll show you places where it's not working, and it'll show you places where there's construction, or you can tell that and the bridge here just isn't big enough or something. So what you could do with that is you identify, you look at a map like that, which can be dynamic, it can be crowdsourced, um, and you can find all of the bottlenecks in the transportation system, things that need fixing. Now, the image is that you combine this with the Adopt a Highway program, where people say, okay, we're going to take responsibility for fixing this bridge or whatever. Now, the metaphor starts to break down here a little bit because, you know, that's not really the way you handle highways. Uh, but what I imagine is that we build a similar map of the conflict system with which we interact and agree upon how to respond to all sorts of common issues, to identify things that are going wrong in that system at a local level, at a regional level, at a national level. And then you have groups that say, okay, I'm gonna take responsibility for trying to fix this. And that's what nonprofits, non-governmental agencies, you know, public interest groups do is they find, okay, nobody's paying enough attention to preserving the habitat for the sage grouse. We're gonna do that. Um, what we need is to cultivate. And you know, a summit like this, you know, in a sense, at least my image is that the summit brings together leaders of organizations that do this kind of work. And what you need is a system for doing a little bit better job of identifying the gaps, the places where we need this kind of collective action, and that 
that aren't getting the attention they deserve and to try to channel some of this energy that's out there into working on those problems. And there, you know, I think you alluded to the notion that this is really one of the most rewarding things you can do in life is to find some place where you can make a difference. I know a lot of my students, I mean, that was the thing that they wanted to do when they grew up. They wanted to make a difference somehow. You know, and this shows you how, how to do it. And then you need a, a learning accelerator. And this goes, this is again, another thing that the internet can do is to help people learn how to make a contribution in each area more effectively so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So um, you, you've been working with, with intractable problems and I, I don't wanna shy away from those. A couple of things that came came um, emerged for me as I was hearing you. One is going back to that part of it's easier to uh, get connected or to collaborate or to agree on what is it that we want to move away from than actually move towards. And I'm just, I, I totally see that, but I, I also feel that might be might be one of the reasons that get us stuck because i mean we can sense the energy difference when we are moving away from something out of uh, fear or of not wanting because the pain it causes to us and uh, in comparison to moving forward in the direction of something that we want to bring to life like mm -hmm. it's more it's easier to get to get uh hold on on being against racism than to actually think working for uh you know the diversity and everybody has a place in it it's easier to get track on this one but i feel in the end of the day when we look at the the the, the challenges we have if we could have a vision that would be attractive to a big part of the population that would maybe put in place more energy flowing you know because it's just more there's a more it's a more vital place and i wonder what you think about that and the other thing is just to put already the other the other part of that i got some questions about is on the maps thing i love the idea but i was thinking like how much we can also get stuck in in a in a management and control kind of of uh, mental view or worldview where we have maps of the current structures and things we have in place and then we are thinking like where are the issues we need to, to solve or to, to, to change and maybe and that's a question mark that perhaps also is worth uh, exploring here but is like maybe on some of these uh, systems we want to be all the looking at there's no uh, Fix, fixing the leakage anymore that is going to take us in another place. So we might be, you know, uh, working on putting energy on sorting things which actually need to be left aside completely. Like some of the systems, I have like questions around the, we were the other day talking about money and if we, we can try to f fix some things, but the whole, a big part of the architecture of money and finances is essentially prob problematic so we might try to make it to put some fixing uh, energy on that that actually doesn't solve the the essential problem that is at the base of its creation or construction so yeah those, those are the things that just came 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 up that i would hear love to hear a bit of your sense into those yeah um, those are all very good points i think the <clears throat> Uh, one of the things that we spend a fair amount of time talking about, and I think it is enormously important, and if one could achieve this or get closer to it, it would be a huge step forward, is to put together a vision of what the new democracy or the new world order. You know, I mentioned earlier that we're trying to figure out how to get to a a way of working together as a global community that actually really works and that addresses a lot of the shortcomings and equities and injustices of the past system. So it's not just putting it back, but we need a, a vision of what that looks like. And the line that I use that I think 
makes a certain amount of sense is what we need is a more diverse diversity uh, within the progressive liberal coalition. There is a commitment to this notion of diversity and coexistence and all of that. That is, I think, the basis of the way you would make such a diverse world actually work. But at least in this country and in the parts of it that I'm familiar with, the embrace of diversity sort of stops once you leave the progressive liberal coalition. Uh, that there isn't really room for folks who believe that abortion is murder. Uh, there isn't room for folks who have much more conservative views on marriage and all of this sort of thing. So how you make it diverse diversity that has tolerance, coexistence, and mutual respect that crosses some of these really bitter political divisions is a big challenge. And it's the kind of thing that will never be perfectly solved, but I think we can do a whole lot better than we have. But bringing together, and Heidi's been involved in some projects years ago, that were community efforts to try to imagine what um, the world we'd like to live in looks like. And to start to bring together folks on all sides of the political divide, not just the progressive side or the conservative side, and imagine what that might be. And if you could get some sort of a vision that did have broad support, it's a whole lot easier to move beyond the troubles of the past if you have a clear image of where you'd like to go that you see as much better. So I think that's a big part of all that. Um, I, the other thing on this mapping stuff is the map can quickly become a tool of some sort of authoritarian control where somebody said, this is the vision and this is everybody else's. But what the vision I had of this and why I use the Google Maps thing as an example, which is a little bit weak, but it has this crowdsource component. Um, and what you want is something that's a lot more nuanced and has identifies a lot more different problems. But what you want is some sort of centralized system, and you could build some software that would do this that would identify places where people could say, you know, here's an area where things could be better. And we need somebody to just do this. Now, I'm not in a position to do it, but I'd sure like to see somebody do it. And if you could have a system like that, where folks who want to volunteer, get involved, make a difference, could sort of systematically look through ideas that people have and say, hey, yeah, that's something I could work on. Um, I think that kind of, that, that's a sort of emergent, ground up, uh, not centralized way of large scale planning that could start to nudge the system in a much more positive direction. I wanna go back to the, to the vision question and this idea of you know, the power being drawn towards a positive vision and the challenges associated with that, um, that Nunu named and, and, and connect that up with this idea of, of a more diverse diversity. Because I wonder if, you know, there are lots of groups that have been working on, you know, a new story, a new vision. The idea that that's a powerful lever for systemic change is not a new one, um, you know, and, and yet somehow, I mean, my sense has always been a bit of confusion when people say, well, we don't know, we don't have this new story. I'm like, I, I hear it all over the place. I recognize it, I sense it, but but is it in a form, particularly where it goes beyond, um, you know, the, the choir uh, and resonates and, and maybe not. But I wonder if the challenge there is actually that we need a diversity of visions, right? That the world we're looking to, to create is actually one where the solutions people find, the new ways of being together that have us rise above, you know, or move beyond these intractable conflicts and start co-creating and healing and restoring and regenerating requires a, all kinds of different stuff. And it's very contextual with, you know, particular locations and cultures and histories and all of this stuff. And 
So on the one hand, you have this need for this diversity. On the other hand, because it is new, because we're, we're in a moment of shift, we actually don't fully know, right? Where there's all of this uncertainty about what will work, what is possible, what takes us beyond, you know, the colonized mindset out of which we're, we're, we're so often stuck in our thinking. So, so I guess my challenge back to you is, is it really a vision that we need or is it somehow, is there a parallel to this diversity and how do we, how do we get drawn to a space with a multiplicity of visions, many of which might not seem compatible at some level with one another and yet somehow we have to hold that conflict too. Well, I think that it's certain, uh, a couple of points. One is I have a, a PowerPoint slide that I use a lot that features people different ways of building bridges. So it's got bridge spans that are going out into the ocean and one's a suspension bridge and another is a truss bridge and another is a cantilever bridge. Guy, if so you have it there, we can, you can share it if you want to share it on the screen to show. I don't have it where I can uh, okay. find it very so easily. Okay. Don't worry. Uh, I, I can send it to you. But the idea is that the way we build bridges is very different from where, depending on where you're coming from. Um, a second idea, which is, I think, very important, which is an extension of uh, insights from the world of biodiversity, is that we also need social diversity. So you don't want a monoculture where everybody believes and thinks the same. But what you want to do is encourage lots and lots of different cultures and different approaches, but that there's a commonality that somehow underlies all of this diversity, where we recognize that at least with respect to some things, uh, we agree to work together. There are some fundamental human rights that we all agree to, to um, protect. Uh, this suggests that we don't want to fall into the trap of framing every grievance and aspiration as a right. Because the nice thing about once whatever it is you want you frame as a right, then everybody else has to give it to you and you don't have to compromise. And if they don't, they're evil. Um, so you don't want to go that far. But there is a need for this underlying commonality. There's a need to find a certain amount of competition that you know, the truth is that the communities that will make it in the 21st century are ones that work out these problems. And the ones that have Humpty Dumpty moments are sadly going to be in tough shape. And there's nothing one can really do about that except to try to in build a system in which we can learn from one another. Um, but getting to, you know, the another metaphor that we use that I think makes sense is in part built on Karen Armstrong's Charter of Compassion. And she is a religious scholar who figured out years ago that all the world's religions in one way or another um, embody the principle of the golden rule in Christianity. Um, and, you know, don't do to others, which, you know, I, or, and the idea simply is that you don't want to treat others, or you want to treat others in the way you'd like to be treated. So what you do is try to encourage people, and again, this is a kind of exercise that you could do in the context of building this vision, is to learn how to look at themselves as others see them. So when you do things that seem to you as just being perfectly reasonable and sticking up where, for what you see as the sort of fundamental moral values, um, be able to see how somebody else sees that as threatening to their moral values. And there are a lot of things that one could do to um, facilitate that kind of a discussion. The other thought that I might share that I think also bears on this is we think about second, third, and fourth order problems. So if you imagine 
a discrete problem like how to respond to a pandemic. Then there are a whole series of medical steps that you want to do. And then you look at all the places where we're not doing those things. And you say, well, why aren't we doing those things? And a lot of those get you into the realm of social and political problems of one sort or another, flaws in the political system, um, corrupt political figures of one sort or another, uh, lack of education, training, all of these things. So those are your second order problems. And those are as important to solve as the first order problem. But you go to your second order problems and then there will be a whole series of reasons why those are hard to solve. So then you've got the third order problems and solving those things is just as important. So you, this is another way of mapping what needs to be done. You don't just think in terms of your first order goals. You think in terms of systematically removing the obstacles that prevent you from achieving your first order goals. And those should get as much attention and they tend to fall through the cracks as the first order goals. Yeah, or, or you can see uh, uh, very frequently with uh, institutions trying to address uh, certain problems and then creating other order problems uh, with the solutions they offer, right? So I think this yeah, is really an important corollary. Yeah. This is the really unintended consequence problem. Yes, definitely. And uh, and 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 that that problem is, I think, um, even raised to a higher level if we consider that also the way we monitor impacts or the results of the choices we make or of the decisions we take or the solutions we find and put in place are of often designed by the same kind of mentality that created the problems in the first place. So you're kind of stuck in this vicious circle of, and, and you touch on, on, on a few things that are, for me are dear. One is this, this definitely this diversity, the diverse diversity in all, all spheres of, of, of thinking, of doing, of being, but also this sense that um, we need to raise the bar of collaboration to a whole new level. Otherwise we keep, if we keep in these silos of looking at problems from very specific uh, places, we, we are stuck in the same, in the same pattern and, and producing the same, the, the results that, uh, that, that, are not, that, that are not satisfying anybody. And you mentioned generalists, that's definitely one thing, but I'm also considering that, and I think that's something would be love to touch in this conversation, your views on structural aspects that, that are part of our landscape that kind of uh, are big barriers to the shift of the way of thinking and the way of being in facing these intractable problems. And one of them is we have gated institutions both academ academia, politics, economics, these are all gated institutions where it feels like to arrive to a place of power, both in terms of being recognized that you say something that, that is referenced to others, like that can be accepted as uh, some, some level of truth. To get there, you need to go through such a journey that you end up on the wrong side of the of, of the place you know like you end up being part of the problem also so i wonder what's your take on on this because it, the, those definitely feel like very intractable problems and i guess that's one of the reasons why some people say be like nero and you know burn burn the whole thing down in order to create something totally new but yeah, yeah. well there are a, a couple of thoughts um one is that there um, is a lot to be said for focusing on evolutionary incremental change as opposed to revolutionary change. And there are lots of reasons why revolutions fail. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about what we call the Crane Britain effect. And he, he wrote a book, The Anatomy of Revolutions, that was a case study of five revolutions, the French and the Russian Revolution and some other 
And basically what he observed, and this problem has repeated itself again and again and again with tragic consequences, is you have a society with a corrupt, failed system of governance that everybody hates. And so you have a revolution, you overthrow that system, and all of the nonviolent dispute resolution processes attached to it. And you find that the revolutionaries only agreed that they hated the old system. They didn't agree on what the new system was going to be. So, so you have a the period same thing. Of, they know what they didn't want it, but they didn't know what they wanted altogether. So you have you have a period of conflict over with the revolutionary factions fighting over what it is that they want. And you don't have institutions that restrain that to a nonviolent, you don't that violence limiting institutions are gone. So eventually the most violent and ruthless faction emerges victorious and you have a new corrupt government and you're basically back in an authoritarian state where you started. So that's the argument against revolutionary change. But incrementalism, where you take, you know, you find a problem and you can't totally fix it, but you can at least agree on this sort of thing, which makes it a little bit better, and has a lot to recommend it. But what it does over time is it produces what's been called a kludgeocracy. A kludge is a... Um, basically a way of putting together a machine that sort of does what you want it to do, but it's really poorly designed and it's made out of spare parts that you find around and is really pretty bad at it. And what we now have in the United States, and I, I'm pretty confident lots of other places, is all of our major institutions, whether it's higher education or healthcare, or whatever, are kludges. And there have been so many of these incremental little changes made over the years that have been expedient and crazy uh, that it just doesn't work. And you get to the point where you got to clean it out somehow or you've got real trouble. But you got to, you know, you can, so you need this middle ground between radical total change and just expedient incremental fixes and that's it like the, it sounds like goldilocks meets humpty dumpty right <laughs> we need it to fall apart to a certain degree we need to be able to put new pieces together but we can't break it so badly that we can't put it together at all right I, which sounds like, you know, a, a challenge. I, you know, I, I, I want to go back to, to the question of the gaps and the map and, and, the, and this theory that says what's, what needs to be accelerated is the level of collaboration. And, and I wonder, because one of the things you also said very early on is how, you know, all of these initiatives are under-resourced yeah. in this domain. And, you know, what if what if it's not so much you know I'm thinking also of of you know Paul Hawkins famous insight in blessed unrest that there's this equivalent to you know white blood cells in in the immune system of the earth just an uncountable number of initiatives stepping in to fill every little niche you know you named the sage grouse for example yeah well, that exists right you know right. pretty much anything you name there's a group of people that cares about that and at some level is organizing around that but there are, you know, so many of them are massively under-resourced. So I wonder if, you know, how much of our, pro of our story about the problem being we're not collaborating well is coming from the fact that we're all struggling, you know, we're all starving to some degree, that we can't, you know, if we want to make our living being part of the solution, well, good luck with that, right? You got it. That's a yeah. side gig. <laughs> that can't be your main job unless you're one of the very privileged few. And, and how much would things change if we figured out how to collectively resource the whole ecosystem of this stuff and let, you know, much the way a forest distributes the rain that the clouds bring down and even calls that rain down, uh, we are now learning, you know, uh -huh. that it's, it, it's just we need more water. <laughs> yeah. we, would, we would, the whole thing would thrive if we had that. Um, well, that raises all sorts of interesting questions. I mean, there, 
there, there's an inherent conflict of interest with a lot of these activist groups that, and I think back to my first image of the environmental movement when I was a kid, which was a picture of soap suds coming off Lake Erie in the United States that was big enough to bury giant trees. And this was a time when the Cuyahoga River routinely caught fire. And so you have the early days of the environmental movement where we really were struggling against the DDT and the threat of a silent spring. And an awful lot of the problems got solved, but then my generation and the generations that follow grew up and a lot of folks wanted to be environmental activists. So you increasingly find smaller and smaller problems. And you wind up, and we get, we're on all these mailing lists, and you get lots and lots of groups that in order to get the money that they need to continue to operate, they basically oversell the problem that they're trying to deal with and over demonize the other side. And that I think is part of what, you get this working on both the right and the left, and that I think is part of what's driving us apart, is that there are, is this conflict of interest that we need to find a, a way to work through. Um, so that's one part of it. Um, but I think in principle, this all still sort of makes sense. Oh, I guess the other point I was gonna make is that this raises another, big question, which is how do we find productive jobs for everybody? And this is a different source of social tension, but I think it's very important. Um, I had a professor when I was an undergraduate who uh, would draw a triangle on the blackboard, which is your standard social hierarchy where you have a few positions at the top of the social hierarchy and a lot more as you worked your way down. And what we've, and then he went on to talk about societies in which there weren't enough people with the skills to fill the top part of the social hierarchy and how that causes one set of problems. Or you have societies where there are too many people with skills in the top to fill the top of the hierarchy and that causes a different set of problems. But what we've seen over the last many decades now is a systematic and very successful effort to give people the skills to work at the upper levels of the social hierarchy. Um, the problem is that we haven't been comparably as creative in finding and financing and funding profitable things for people to do at this hierarchy. So you have being a college professor rapidly turning into a minimum wage job as you have, you have all these PhDs coming out, and they're working terrible shifts with as adjunct professors. You find people who come out with all these skills and they go into finance and mostly what they're trying to do is to um, figure out some clever financial instrument that they can use to take money from somebody else or to protect somebody else's money from getting being taken. So it's a giant zero sum game. And there are all sorts of other problems that arise because we've got all these people who can fill high level positions, but we're not using them very effectively. And so you have doctors who, you know, where there's, um, we have all these skilled folks, but then again, when you go to the doctor, he, you can sort of see on his wrist, he's got three minutes to talk to you. And that, healthcare could be a lot better if we could get some of these people to work on that kind of thing. And there's certainly lots that we could do in terms of comprehensive environmental planning that would protect things. Um, but we need to figure that out and that would solve a lot more of the problems. But I think explicitly focusing on how we can better utilize the skills 
of folks that have come through educational systems with a lot more skills. We have a more educated population than we ever had before. It would be a big step forward. We, and I'm noticing we are, we are running out of time, so we have um, maybe a chance to do one final round with comments. Uh, the, your, your last comments, uh, Guy, ma made me reflect on a lot of things. And again, I, I'm kind of drawn into the same place of this pattern of the, the same mentality that created the problems, then if it's put on the solutions, is also creating more problems. And particularly in the educational system where we spend so much time uh, in our early lives uh, that it actually totally shapes and informs our way of thinking and our imagination towards what is possible. And that, that is, I, I mean, I don't know if I mentioned to you before, but I'm, I'm an, uh, I've studied economics and I've studied uh -huh. economics in the same way, like most probably more than 90% of the, of the economic students around the world based on Chicago School of, of, of Understanding Economics, which is, is, a, is actually one of the responsible uh, places of understanding economic that led us to be in a situation we are in, where economics is just looked as a way of managing resources and, you know, for the use of human beings, which was totally different from other ways of thinking economics like... Um, Schumacher or the, the economists of, of uh, Gandhi's um, first government who held a totally different way of understanding economy, economics, which is not being introduced in the economic studies around the world. So you have these people who are bri have brilliant minds, beautiful human beings, who went to, to study economics maybe with the intention to, to change, to make the world a better place, like most of us go when you go to college with a lot of ideals, and get out of there with the wrong set of tools and mind frames to help them in that process. And it's the same it happens with you know, man, uh, management, with uh, lawyers who will go there to find a, study law to find a sense of justice and promote justice and leave, leave the law studies to go to work in, in, uh, in companies that actually protect the, the vested interests of a few. So yeah, that dynamic is quite strong. So uh, the, I wonder what kind of other ways that people are finding now to learn and to do their own pathways that maybe, maybe equip us better to address these this intractable problems. And, and that's what I'm kind of st leaving from our conversation. Besides some really important gifts from you, like this diverse diversity, more collaboration, moving beyond what separates us and looking for things that, that can unite us uh, in, in moving forward and, and changing uh, the, the world around us. And yeah, and that is a combination of things, of addressing some of the current things, some others um, creating new possibilities that are not foreseen before. There's more, but I actually going to leave also Ben to do a bit of his summary and would love to have your final words on some of the, the things you would like to leave to, to the audience that is listening to us before we close this. I'm, I love the word kludocracy. <laughs> I, I have a friend who's sort of an, an uber handyman, master carpet, carpenter and cabinet maker, but can do all kinds of other things. And he's a master of the kludge. And, and, and my sense of him is he's proud of his kludges, you know, that if you can figure out how to keep something oh. working without having to buy a whole new thing and it's cheap and you're using the stuff that's at hand, there's something magical about that. Um, so I think there's different ways to look at it. I just love the term and the concept and, um, and this notion somehow to, you know, that, that we're in, we're looking for a merger of Goldilocks and, and Humpty Dumpty as our, as our models, that, that there's a generative dynamic polarity between how much things 
you know, not only are falling apart, but need to fall apart. And we need new ways to, to, to do the things we need to do, new ways, you know, put pieces together, the central, essential elements of how we live together, you know, need to be reconfigured. And that if we break, if things get too broken, it's beyond our capacity to do that and we're into collapse. So it seems like that's a useful story in terms of thinking through some of the points of tension and conflict and disagreements we have about, you know, what is that positive future we're drawn to especially given that we, we, um, we don't necessarily know. Uh, and and that if, if we know anything about it, it's not gonna look like one thing. Um, so so how, do we, how do we handle all of that? All right, a couple of sort of, I guess they're partly responses and partly closing thoughts. Um, I think that somehow or another we need to reform the higher education system, the education system more generally um, in ways that get us out of just learning and repeating the orthodoxies of the past and really challenging a lot of the ideas. And part of this is that we have this hyper-competitive meritocracy. So in order to make it through the system, um, you're, the system is basically in a position to insist that you do things exactly the way they want you to do them. And the system tends to encourage that kind of behavior and reward people who are willing to do it. And we tend not to ask the hard questions. We tend to lapse too much into group think and it gets us trapped. And we need to break out of that. We need to break out also of the conflict of interest problem. I read a disturbing article that identified five strains of economic thought, each funded by a particular interest group to produce self-serving conclusions. And that's not what science should ought to be about. And the other point that I think is worth making, and I don't think I raised this in the earlier interview, but even if I did, it's important. Um, years ago, we got a big grant from the Hewlett Foundation for a conflict resolution, to establish a conflict resolution center at the University of Colorado. And this was all to develop collaboration, resolution, win-win, salute, all that sort of stuff. And we told our friends, most all of whom were activists of one sort or another, environmental, social justice. And they were aghast. They thought we were compromising our values and were, were traitors to the cause in a sense. And we try to organize seminars and we get you know, three out of a hundred people would show up. It's all very depressing. And then we got the bright idea to reframe the question. And instead of talking about resolution and compromise, we talked about how can we advocate for whatever interests we really believe in more constructively. And then we went from having a 97% rejection rate to about a 97% acceptance rate. That activists were very much aware of the fact that the process that they were involved in was very destructive. And they wanted very much to make that better. Uh, they just didn't want to compromise their core beliefs and values. So we've tried to frame over the years, a lot of what we've done, not from third party neutral intermediary perspectives, but from first party advocacy perspectives, and to show people how a more sophisticated view of conflict dynamics can help them advance their interests. And that, I think, is still the key, is to look at this not as a tool for squashing disagreeable conflict, but how to make conflict really fulfill its role as what I call the primary engine of social learning in a society. That the whole 
conflict interaction is somebody says, hey, you know, the world would be better if you just, just do this differently. And it's about making wise, equitable, efficient, nonviolent, compassionate decisions about which changes are and aren't appropriate. Thank you so much for that, Guy, for that. It feels really relevant and like the great, a great place to finish our conversation. It was a pleasure, uh, as the last time, to, to have you uh, in, the, in these talks. Thank you so much for finding the time and the space to, to be with us. Well, certainly, and I look forward to the summit, and we should stay in touch. There's a lot that we can find ways to do together. Definitely. Thank you, Ben, for being on, on this interview together with me today. And looking forward for future conversations. All right.